Thank you very much, Uma. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be up here in San Francisco, traveling in the same time zone. Uh, so we're going to uh, be talking about um, health maintenance and quality, uh, and actually the title that uh, is in your booklets is Creating a Checklist, and we'll talk at the end about checklists. Um, so since quality is in the title, I thought it would be appropriate to start with the quality measures that are um, part of the PQRS and AGA Digestive Health Registry. I'm just curious, by show of hands, how many people participate in PQRS? Okay, um, about, f I would say, maybe 10% of the audience, um, which is pretty consistent with, uh, with, with when I ask this question in, in audiences in general. I suspect that number is going to go up as the carrots turn into sticks. Uh, but if you look at the eight measures that are part of the AGA um, measure set, um, half of them are relate, or actually five out of eight of them relate to um, health maintenance, and so we'll be discussing some of those issues. Um, th we did a survey uh, at Cedars with respect to our tertiary care IBD population just to ask patients if we talk about infections and the risk of uh, vaccine preventable infections, how many patients actually received the vaccinations that they're supposed to receive. You can see in blue um, are, are uh, the risk factors that patients actually had, and in the red are the proportion of patients that actually received the preventive measure, the vaccination against that particular infection. And you can see here a very significant discrepancy, um, and this is now almost 10 years ago, uh, between what patients should have received and what they have received. Um, studies that have been done subsequently uh, around the world continue to show a very significant gap between what patients should be receiving and what they actually receive when it comes to preventing infections. And the notable thing about this is that most of our patients do have primary care providers who they have seen recently, and somehow they're falling through the cracks. The primary care providers aren't necessarily as educated about IBD-specific medications, about IBD-specific uh, recommendations for health maintenance, and so many of these issues that pertain to our patients who we, we may think are being taken care of by their primary care providers may not be, um, and it's up to us to ensure that that gap gets closed. When it comes to influenza vaccination, um, pretty much everybody should get a, a vaccine for uh, influenza on an annual basis, um, regardless of whether they're immunosuppressed or not. Uh, there are particular high-risk groups, those who are currently receiving immune suppression, those who are healthcare workers, so all of us in this room, and household contacts of high-risk individuals. And household contacts is an important um, component of protecting our patients who are otherwise more susceptible to infection based on their medication profiles. Um, I want to throw some numbers at you because we talk a lot about the need for uh, these preventive health measures without a lot of data backing up that there's strong evidence to support their use. Uh, and so there is accumulating evidence. We now have some evidence that there is a higher risk of the flu in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. This is a uh, uh, study that was done looking at claims data, 30 million patients, and trying to select out patients with inflammatory bowel disease versus controls in the United States from uh, in the late 2000s. Um, and uh, what you can see here is that the risk of, of influenza is higher among patients with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis relative to the control population on the order of about 70 cases per 10,000 patients. But not only are patients with inflammatory bowel disease at higher risk for getting influenza, but they're also at higher risk for getting complications of influenza. And in particular, those would be pneumonia, which is not significantly higher than um, those without IBD, but importantly, hospitalization. And whether that's because influenza itself is the cause of the hospitalization, or perhaps influenza may be associated with a flare of inflammatory bowel disease, we don't really know yet. Uh, but certainly, hospitalization is a significant complication that is, high, that is seen at a higher rate in our patients with IBD. Related to influenza is pneumonia, which can often accompany the flu uh, as a super infection. And this is a study by Millie Long, again looking at claims data, showing that the risk of pneumonia is very significant in patients with inflammatory bowel disease relative to controls, almost double the uh, control population when it comes to Crohn's disease. There are uh, relatively new guidelines for pneumonia vaccination for adults. Um, I think in the pediatric world, they've had the PCV, the conjugate vaccine, around for a while. This was recently approved for adults about a year and a half ago, and actually recent guidelines from the Infectious Disease Society of America suggest that for adults who are immune compromised, we need to be thinking not just of the routine adult pneumococcal vaccine, the, um, the pneumovax, but also 
the conjugated vaccine, which is uh, the Prevnar 13, which is a, uh, has fewer of the pneumonia serotypes in it, but is much more effective at pre preventing pneumonia. And so patients with inflammatory bowel disease who are immune suppressed should be considered for getting both of these vaccines at the schedule that's listed here. Uh, they're typically given about eight weeks apart to confer the maximum protection. There's also another respiratory infection I just want to highlight here, and that's pertussis, because we in California have had the, um, the, uh, the, the, the great honor of um, having an outbreak in 2010 that has now spread throughout the rest of the country. Every one of the continental United States states in the U.S. has had a pertussis outbreak since our outbreak in 2010 um, that we've basically exported out. Uh, and really insufficient vaccination is thought to be the culprit of this pertussis vaccination. And the individuals that are most at risk are actually not our patients, but their children under the age of one. Uh, and so there's been a public health campaign. I'm sure many of us in this room have been exposed to that public health campaign to vaccinate against pertussis with the Tdap vaccine and to be thinking about it. Um, there does not seem to be an increased risk of pertussis among individuals who are immune suppressed. However, individuals who are immune suppressed can and should be still targeted for vaccination. And so there have been many studies that have looked at whether people with, uh, with IBD who are on immune suppression actually can mount appropriate immune responses. I'm not going to show you the data here, uh, but there have been studies for influenza and pneumococcal vaccine and the pertussis vaccine as well, which will be published soon, basically showing that if you're on immune suppression, you still do mount a vaccine response. However, that vaccine response is slightly lower than it would be had one not been on immune suppression. Um, so being on combination therapy especially does lower antibody responses to these vaccines, but the point is that you do still get some response. And so for all of these vaccines that I've mentioned, uh, these are vaccines that should be given irrespective of whether an individual is on immune suppressive therapy or not. And because immune suppression is unpredictable and the likelihood of response is lower when someone's on vaccination, many recommend for individuals to get vaccinated even before they're on immune suppression. So I want to move on from the respiratory infections and talk a little bit about some other vaccine-preventable infections before talking about some other areas in healthcare maintenance. So hepatitis B is something that we all should be checking for prior to starting an anti-TNF. It's in the label. It's been known for a very long time, but I just want to highlight it. It's one of the AGA quality measures, um, and it's actually a very significant risk, and that risk is reactivation of hepatitis B. We're asked to be documenting risk assessment, whatever that means, whether it's asking the patient about risk factor, actually checking hep B serologies. Um, in order to identify those patients with latent hepatitis B. Uh, vaccination for hep B is safe on immune suppression. It's a non-live virus, vac virus vaccine, and it is effective um, even in individuals who are immune suppressed. And this is, it's hard to study um, hep B reactivation in IBD patients because it's not that common. And so what this is is a pooled analysis of reports that have been published in the literature. And what you can see here is for individuals, this is a European um, report. Most of these cases do come from Europe. Uh, for individuals who are HEPI service antigen positive, the reactivation risk upon starting infliximab was 39%, with five, uh, five fulminant cases of which four died. Um, and for an isolated HEPI core positive, uh, which typically is not something we would think of as a significant risk for actual re reactivation of HEPI, B, there's still a 5% reactivation risk. And among, this, uh, among these individuals that were uh, included in this cohort, there was one death. So we have to be very aware of the risk of HEPI reactivation and be checking for HEPI prior to starting an anti-TNF. And that's why it's remained one of the quality measures, even though it's been in our consciousness for so long. HPV uh, has been linked with cervical and anal cancer in women and in men. Uh, women with IBD do have an increased risk for an abnormal pap smear that's been shown in a few studies, and also in one study showing that there's a higher risk for certain HPV serotypes that may be more likely to cause cancer. Uh, there are more recent HPV and pap smear guidelines for uh, the general population, but to point out there, meaning that the, uh, which actually relaxed the uh, intervals by, by which women should get a pap smear under certain circumstances, but these do not apply, importantly, to women who are on immune suppressive therapy because their risk of progression from HPV seropositivity uh, to cervical dysplasia and cervical cancer remains high. Uh, the HPV vaccine is available and it's safe in immunosuppressed individuals. It is indicated for women and men uh, younger than the age of 26 and should be considered um, in all these individuals, especially if they are immunosuppressed. 
So I want to move on and talk a little bit about live virus vaccines. In general, we have a dogma that's been around for decades that we should not be giving live virus vaccines to individuals who are immune suppressive therapy. And listed here are, immune, are, are live virus vaccines that we might uh, come across, uh, live attenuated influenza virus. Many of our children might be offered this at the pediatrician's office. Yellow fever for those who are traveling to yellow fever endemic areas. The BCG vaccine not given in the United States, but given uh, many places around the world, MMR vaccine, varicella, and zoster. And just uh, to point out here specifically, among this list, um, the zoster vaccine in the CDC guidelines, it's been there for almost 10 years now, and this was one of the questions, is that zoster vaccine can and should be given in individuals who are on quote unquote low doses of immune suppression. And the doses are listed here. All of these doses are pretty much doses that we would have our patients on for IBD. And they include steroids, thiopurines, and methotrexate. Um, and so for these medications in the guidelines without any evidence, because the risk is so high, the recommendations are to uh, vaccinate these individuals when they uh, are at the age of 60 or older because of the significant risk of shingles. However, anti-TNF therapy uh, is specifically singled out um, and now uh, is specifically singled out as, as a medication on which the shingles vaccine should not be given because of the unknown risks of infection from the vaccine. Um, and I just want to raise this because it's really challenging our dogma of understanding the risks of vaccination with a live vaccine in individuals who are immune suppressed. And specifically, I think this is an important issue when it comes to zoster and how dogmatic should we really be. This is another study by Millie Long looking at the risk of herpes zoster of shingles in inflammatory bowel disease. And you can see that the risk of shingles, again, is double in patients with Crohn's disease. This is all the way on the left. Do I have a pointer here? Um, Okay, so here you can see that the risk of shingles in, in IBD and Crohn's disease is, is double that in the general population. And what I want to point out here on the right is that this risk goes up with age. Now, in the general population, we have accepted as a society that the risks and benefits of, of shingles vaccination is appropriate over the age of 60. That's what the guidelines say. Actually, it's licensed over the age of 50. Um, and in the general population, you can see here, for example, is non-UC uh, and non-CD. This risk is right around here, around between around seven to 800 per 100,000 cases. Now, patients with IBD actually hit that incidence all the way down here at age 20 to 30. So our patients with IBD at ages 20 to 30 have the same risk of shingles as the general population does at the age of 60. And we've determined as a society, uh, at least as of now, that that's the age that everyone should be considering getting vaccination. So I submit that we, might be think we maybe should be thinking about shingles vaccination even earlier in our patients with IBD. Um, and I'm sure we've all seen this. This is a patient of mine who presented with shingles on adalimumab, and this was disseminated shingles. You can see it doesn't stick to the little dermatome that we typically are taught in medical school. Um, this was disseminated shingles um, in, in an individual very young um, who was on immune suppressive therapy. Um, so the, um, the shingles vaccine is a live virus vaccine. As I mentioned, it's um, recommended for individuals over the age of 60 and generally considered contraindicated um, among immune suppressed with the caveats that I mentioned about the low doses of immune suppression. But there was an interesting study that was published a couple of years ago that looked at individuals who may have been accidentally vaccinated with the shingles vaccine to see how they did. And they identified half a million people with various chronic immune diseases, many of whom were on anti-TNF therapies. And they found that of those who got the shingles vaccine while on anti-TNF therapy, quote unquote, accidentally, um, those individuals, none of them had any shingles infection reported after the vaccine and they followed them out for six weeks. But not only that, when they compared them to a non-vaccinated control cohort, their risk of getting shingles was much lower. So they were protected from the vaccine. They didn't have any risk from the vaccine. And we know that this is a very significant issue. So as uh, Marla pointed out at the beginning, maybe the answer to the question should be none of the above. And I suspect it will be. This hasn't quite made it into the guidelines, but I think the evidence is, um, is suggestive that we can and maybe should be considering everybody on immune suppression for the shingles vaccine. Other uh, pearls from our latest IDSA guidelines that come out that uh, I get, we get asked about a lot is how long do you have to wait to start immune suppression after a live virus vaccine? Typically, uh, the answer is four weeks. 
Um, we would not, uh, you know, I've been talking a lot about the shingles vaccine, but I do want to emphasize that that is considered an exception. The other live vaccines should not be given to individuals who are on immune suppression. And household contacts is also a frequent question that comes up that individuals uh, can um, allow their household contacts and they should have their children get vaccinated for almost all of the usual childhood vaccines. I want to switch gears from talking about preventable infections and health maintenance to a few other topics. Um, this is the topic of venous thromboembolism, and I actually um, was reminded of it literally this week when a patient of mine, an outpatient of mine, was admitted with extensive bilateral acute DVTs. Um, this is a 47-year-old woman who's, um, who happened to be on steroids for a, for a Crohn's flare. Um, and this has been also known now for several years at the risk of of uh, thromboembolic events is very significantly increased in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, such that even in the ambulatory setting, um, that risk is, uh, is six-fold higher than those without inflammatory bowel disease. In those who are hospitalized, that risk is 37 uh, per 1,000 patient years. So very significant elevated risk um, to the point where we need to be thinking about what we can do to reduce um, this risk in the outpatient and in the inpatient settings. We can improve our patient's nutrition. We can reduce inflammation through whatever means we can. Smoking cessation as a risk factor. Think about oral contraceptives in our young women with IBD who have got active flare, especially if they're smokers. Um, and then finally, most importantly, in patients who are in the hospital, we should not be afraid of using um, prophylactic measures in order to reduce the risk of thromboembolic events. Um, and that includes the use of low molecular weight heparin and other similar medications. Moving on to touch on some other uh, topics of bone health. Uh, patients with IBD are at increased risk for osteoporosis and osteoporotic fractures. And you can see here the progression in the, in the picture. It's quite striking. I actually show this to patients about what this actually looks like under the microscope, um, normal bone progressing to osteoporosis. And you can see here the bone demineralization clearly leads to risk of fracture. And uh, when it comes to IBD, individuals with risk factors should be considered for uh, screening with DEXA scans. Um, and these are many of the risk factors that almost all of our patients um, may have, with uh, corticosteroids being the most significant. And so um, getting a DEXA scan uh, in our patients, even younger than you know the menopausal age where we might typically think about it in women, as well as in men who have any of these risk factors. Um, another health maintenance issue is that we has uh, risen to the fore over the last few years is skin cancer. And uh, there has been accumulating evidence suggesting an increased risk of skin cancer in patients who are on thiopurines. This is non-melanoma skin cancer, and you can see that that risk increases with age, even in patients not just who are on thiopurines in the dark gray, but as well as patients who have previously been on thiopurines and discontinued them in the light gray. Melanoma is also thought to be potentially related to uh, as an increased risk in individuals with in, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Another study by Millie Long using the same database um, showed that patients with IBD, both Crohn's and UC, did have a slightly increased risk of melanoma. So what can we do about this from a health maintenance standpoint? Well, we can counsel our patients with respect to sun precautions and seeing a dermatologist. So I want to uh, put all of these risks that I've mentioned in perspective, and we've learned a lot about risks from our colleague Corey Siegel, um, who's uh, introduced us to the Palin palette where we think about understanding risks in the context of a common denominator. So this is a common denominator of 10,000 people. And if you uh, look at the risk of dying in a car accident, two per 10,000 people per year die in a car accident, which is a risk that we all accept on a daily basis. So if we think about some of the risks that I've discussed here, uh, melanoma and IBD, as Millie Long showed us, that risk, if we extrapolate from the numbers that she identified, is about six per 10,000 patients per year. Non-melanoma skin cancer, about 50 cases per 10,000 patients per year. The flu, 70. Zoster, if over the age of 50, 100 cases per 10,000 patients per year. Pneumonia, even higher than that. And a, uh, a clot, a blood clot in the hospital, uh, 375 cases per 10,000 patients per year. That's very significant. Uh, and finally, um, among the things that I've spoken about, if somebody's core antibody positive with Hep B, that risk of a flare is, um, is 500 per 10,000 patients per year. So very significant, but the good news is, is that all of these in the red box are preventable. Uh, and through routine health maintenance checks, through routine health maintenance preventive measures. So the title again was Creating a Checklist for Health Maintenance for IBD, and I submit to you that we don't have to create a checklist. There's already one that's created for us, thanks to Cornerstones. Um, so I encourage those of you who are not aware of this checklist, uh, you can go to Cornerstones' website, 
download it for free. Um, I understand, Marla, this was updated just three months ago, so we have uh, the most up-to-date uh, health maintenance um, checklist available, uh, and really this is a way to help remind us what we can do or what we need to do in order to be up-to-date with the health maintenance issues for our patients. Uh, so finally, in summary, we want to prevent those things that are preventable when it comes to uh, the risks that our patients with IBD may be exposed to. There are many preventable infections, the respiratory infections we should be thinking about, influenza and pneumococcal vaccination for all of our patients, irrespective of their immune suppression status. We need to be thinking about HEPI reactivation, reminding ourselves to check status before starting an anti-TNF agent. HPV and cervical cancer, and then the exception of shingles from among the live virus vaccines of something that we can and should be thinking about um, for our patients even on immune suppression. I mentioned sun precautions for our patients who are immune suppressed, bone health, venous thromboembolic prophylaxis, especially in hospitalized patients, and finally to be educating ourselves and educating our patients. Even if we can't provide all of these things to our patients, we can tell them about it and th allow them to be their advocates um, with their primary care providers. Thank you very much. Okay, great.